Hello and welcome. My name is Vincent and thank you for joining me. In this episode we explore another side of my hobby, commission painting. I know it's not epic 40k content, but hopefully it's epic 40k content. Let's paint a towel kill team for a great client of mine here at Bunker 6. <laughs> to anyone who is expecting more 6mm goodness, but I had a commission request come in and thought that perhaps it may be something my audience may still be interested in, due to it still being hobby related, and it's in the same universe. And just a quick side note, Tau does actually exist in 6mm scale, but it was released by Forge World and now costs a small fortune, even if you can find it. Anyway, I digress. In this episode, let's go through the steps and processes I would take to build and paint a Tau kill team. Now I've painted plenty of Tau previously, as it was the first army I started collecting when I got back into the hobby in 2016. I quickly stopped collecting Tau though, as I couldn't be bothered to learn how to play the game at the time. I also couldn't stand magnetising everything, I just wanted to improve my painting skills instead. So I sold a lot and just collected Epic again instead. But enough about me, let's get back to the Tau. My client has asked me to build and paint this kill team as a voila set. If you're not familiar, a sept is a particular subcategory of Tau that, while united under the overall umbrella of Tau, they themselves articulate and express their own unique culture and practices due to their history and location. The red and white Vrala became the more recent GW Studio standard paint scheme for the Tau and can be surprisingly tricky to paint for a newcomer. That's because white can be a tricky colour to paint. But it is my hope that I can make a simple video from start to finish for anyone looking to paint their first ever Tau, or you might be a veteran who's just interested in how someone else does their process. Anyway, let's begin. Let's get our instruction manual, a pen, a fishing bait box or an arts and crafts box, either is fine, a scalpel and or a mold line remover, a variety of very high graded sandpaper, a nail buffer and polisher, and a cutting mat. Now, although I'm a huge Games Workshop fan, I'm not always familiar with every model that comes my way, so I like to really make sure I understand the instructions perfectly before I start building anything. So I'm overlooking the models that will be potentially being built, and if the client hasn't requested a specific loadout, I'll just find a model that interests me and build that. Now I also like to familiarise myself with the sprue and contents of the box. Just make sure that everything is present and correct before I start doing anything, because in case something is missing it could be crucial to the delivery time of a commission. Now once I've familiarised myself with the project size, I find a arts and crafts box or a fishing bait box that suits the size of the project. There are lots of little parts that will need to be sub-assembled and put in their place, and I like to have a little container just in case I don't actually manage to get the commission done in one go, I like to have everything ready and organised when I can come back to it at a future point. Now the next step for me would be to number each model with its corresponding sub-assembly parts in one place. To make the project as efficient as possible, I decided that I was quite happy with the particular loadouts that are presented here in the instruction manual. So I've just found all the corresponding numbered parts, as you can see here, and make sure that each model gets cut with those exact number parts that are next to them. And we have 10 infantry and 3 drones that we'll need to sub-assembling. So we have 12 cubbies in this particular hobby box, so we'll just make sure that the numbers that are in this box correspond with the models and their part numbers accordingly. Now some might argue that I could just leave everything on the sprue instead of cutting all these parts individually all in one go. The thing is I like to get the sprue out of the way as quickly as possible so I feel psychologically I've made a complete step in the process. If I still have things hanging around on a sprue I feel like I'm going back and forth between steps rather than here where everything is completely cut and ready to do the next step in its entirety which will be clean up. I have everything here including the drones and we will start that process process now. If you are new to the hobby, I highly recommend doing any mold line and flashing removal with a mold line removal tool like this sold by Games Workshop. 
It was very helpful for me at the beginning when I was building my confidence to see what kind of angles worked for what particular types of mold lines and where the mold lines are sitting on a model. But I've been doing this hobby for a few years now and the process is pretty simple. It does get a little bit messy with all the tiny bits of dust that you do create. So just make sure you have a very clean work surface before you start doing any painting because that dust can get everywhere. You don't want these mold lines, especially when it comes to washes. Seeing these mold lines can be immersion breaking, but it also can really ruin your paint job too. Washes can build up on these seam lines like you wouldn't believe. So I really highly recommend taking this step, even if it seems a little bit pointless. For the sub-assembly stage, you will require plastic cement, do not use superglue, and you will also need a scalpel. Unlike superglue, which is the bond, plastic cement actually just melts the surfaces of plastic, allowing the two pieces of plastic to bond directly to each other. The glue is more of an activator rather than a glue per se. But like superglue, you still have a little bit of playtime when it comes to how you want things to be lined up. Just make sure that you're following your source material like I have to do here from my instruction manual, and then you can move on. For this stage, you will require a hand drill, a cocktail stick or seven, some Gorilla Glue or super glue, a pair of needle nose pliers, which have a wire cutting section in the center of them, a pilot hole tool, and a bunch of paper clips that you will turn into straight rods like this, which will be the pinning device, and some white tag. Let's begin the pinning process. So firstly, let's create a pilot hole. Be very accurate when you're doing this. You don't want to start stabbing yourself with sharp objects. But as you can see, that's a little hole. It doesn't need to be more than a divot because that just allows the head of the scalpel to slip in so you can start scraping the sides with the scalpel blade and create a larger hole like this. This hole is suitable to start using the hand drill. I would definitely use the hand drill over using a domestic electric drill or a Dremel because the Dremel has a rev speed that is too high in my opinion and can start damaging parts of a model very quickly if you're not very, very accurate. And a domestic electric drill, it's just too big and cumbersome when you're dealing with little models like this. You don't want to be having to hold a very heavy electric drill while you're also trying to hold a fragile piece of plastic. Now onto the pinning process. I'm using this super glue gel. It's absolutely fantastic because one problem with regular super glue is it can be very runny. This gel solves that problem as you can see it's staying in one place and it is so much nicer to work with. If you can get hold of any gel based super glue I highly recommend it. And once the paper clip is sealed in place just let it dry. Now we're going to be looking at the position that we want to have the model on the base. This hole is a guide just to make sure that we're lining everything up correctly as it's shown in the instructions. The reason why we're penning this model is because we want the model to be sitting on top of the basing material rather than being submerged in it. This stage is really for painting preparation. So we're going to just finish off our sub-assembly for the painting process. Now this goes for priming, base coating and all the other additional stages for painting that we will be doing in the future steps. As you can see here, this is the entirety of how much I want to sub-assemble this particular fire warrior. Now, when it comes to the other parts, I'm going to be adding some temporary pinning. That's either going to be with a paperclip or, in the case of the drone, some cocktail sticks because I just need some temporary pins so I can have something to hold on to while I'm airbrushing the model. It's very difficult to hold these little parts when you're trying to airbrush them. It can get messy very quickly. Now, the time that I'm spent doing this, I could actually have just sprayed the model and then let it dry and then grab it in a different place, but I do worry about getting fingerprints or any smudges or anything like that on the model if I did it that way. This way, it's guaranteed to be a clean finish, and I've got nothing to worry about. This model, as you can see, is as much of the sub-assembly as I want to do. Now we're just moving on to the other little parts, like the arms and the additional weapons and additional baggages that are on the back of the pants, and we're just going to be adding these pins temporarily. These will all be snapped off at the very final stage before final assembly once everything is painted. Now you don't have to do this step, but the one thing I like is being able to have things in by sized chunks rather than having a complete model where I can't get into every little nook and cranny. So it might seem unnecessary, but if you're just doing an army that's going to be for the tabletop, this particular step may not be needed. For this stage we will require some mixed sand, a pot to let the sand fall into, some super glue, doesn't matter which, a cocktail stick, a hand drill, 
and some way of holding the base itself. Due to the fact that we're going to be using a lot of superglue, I highly recommend attaching the base to something where your fingers are as far away from the base as possible. Now, some people could say you could use wood glue or PVA glue, but there's something quite robust about superglue. I've tried to use PVA glue and wood glue in the past, but I just prefer the solid results of superglue in this instance. Use a cocktail stick to spread out the applied superglue evenly across the model and try and avoid spillage onto the edges. Now we're going to be applying our mixed sand. Now the client normally likes a sort of space age moon surface feel, so this particular mixed sand, although quite chunky, fits the bill quite well for what the client normally requires from me. Now you can add any type of mixed sand you want, but as you can see, here's the varied results of the sand that we've used here. Now wipe the edge of the base because this particular sand does have quite a lot of dust in it, and you don't want any of that dust when it comes to painting the rim, so just wipe that away. Once the base is clean, you will require some black paint, and some water, some cheap brushes, and a ceramic palette. The reason why we're using a ceramic palette over a wet palette is because we're not going to be needing to keep this paint. This paint is very cheap and I highly recommend not using your modeling paints for this process because it's basically acting as a primer and as a base coat for these bases. Use a hairdryer to make sure that the superglue is completely dry before you start adding any paintbrush strokes to it because you will immediately ruin a paintbrush, even if it's a cheap one, with wet superglue. I highly recommend doing this black paint stage with two coats. Now one of the problems with working in black and white, like the bases are, is things can get a little bit too desaturated. So I like to add a distraction tone, which is going to be this brown, so it slightly offsets the otherwise slightly dull presentation of just a black and white base. Now moving on to the highlights. We're going to be using a very icy grey once again, just a cheap paint, but you don't need to use anything fancy here. I'm using a cheap, very wide, flat-headed brush, and I'm just skating over the surface of the stone, as you can see here. We're barely touching the thing and the more you do it like this the better and make sure that you don't hit the base too hard and sometimes it's better to actually wipe off the brush before you even touch the base and I would do that with a paper towel. Now we're moving on to the final highlight which is this Terminator stone and as you can see just lightly scraping with a smaller brush because we don't need this in as many places and just finding the areas that we want to really highlight and that's that. This step wouldn't take more than roughly 15 to 20 minutes and can be easily mass produced across all the bases equally if you do them all in one go. And here they are. Nice. You will require an airbrush. My airbrush is an Iwata airbrush. I don't really know too much about it, but it does the job that I need it to do. I mainly use it for priming and base coating. You will need a airbrush cleaning pot to hold the airbrush and get rid of any excess materials. As you can see, it sits quite nicely in here. You'll need a pot of water, a paintbrush, old one preferably, and some surface primer. Also, you will need some thinner. Now I might do a separate video on how I use an airbrush, there's obviously people who are far more superior than I when it comes to using one of these, but it's pretty simple, if your airbrush becomes blocked you need to add more thinner as you go. Now I used to be very intimidated by airbrushes, so if you're new here do be aware that you can just use a rattle can, but be very very accurate in how you use it. Always use a rattle can and a crosshatch method and be at least 30 inches away from the model and if the paint starts spattering throw that can away or turn it upside down and blast it a couple of times just to make sure that the can is clear again. Now as you can see here the airbrush has worked but it takes a lot longer to get the white results than you would otherwise get from a regular rattle can. I'll be using scale 75 white, but you can use whatever you want. So we're just adding it to the airbrush now, and we're going to be following up with some thinner. Now I don't really know how much thinner I need, I've never used this particular paint before, and every paint reacts differently inside the airbrush. And now I know a lot of pros actually mix their paints outside of the airbrush, but I'm lazy and I'm an amateur, so that's why I'm doing it in the airbrush. You just add thinner until you get a sort of consistency that you're familiar with, and in this case I think I've got a consistency that would probably work, and as you can see there, the pigment's coming out nice and thick. If the airbrush gets blocked, just add more thinner, and if it's really really blocked, you're going to have to empty the whole thing and give it a good clean. Now we're moving on to the hand painted section. We're going to start with any black you like. I quite like the Vallejo 
model color black because it just gives a much more flat finish. The GW1 has a great pigment consistency, but it's a little bit too shiny for my liking. If you've made any mistakes, just give it a little touch up with the white again. The reason why I didn't include the paintbrush in my tools section is because it really does come down to personal preference of what you're confident using, and in this particular instance I'm using a DaVinci Maestro size 1 brush. Now this particular black paint does require two coats, which is kind of annoying because obviously you want to save as much time as possible, especially when you're doing commission work, but I'll take the extended period of time just because the way in which this paint works is so wonderful. It's very manageable, it lasts a long period of time, it doesn't get thick and chunky and goopy like many other paints can do. And for those saying, well, you can just add matte medium to any paint, well, there's just something about this paint that's just great the way it is. Now here, we're just adding a bit more of the touch-up and a little bit of cleanup where I've made some errors along the way. And now we're moving on to a red base coat. This is very simple. You can use any brush that you like. It's not particularly strong detailed section. There's nothing fancy going on here. All these base coats can pretty much go on with a brush which has got a fine point and not be too worried about the end results. I'm just taking my time here and as you can see I'm making the model work around me rather than me working around the model. Move the model around as much as you want and try and keep your hands as stable and as steady in as one place as often as possible. Now let's move on to the light grey areas of the model. You can use Games Workshop Dawnstone if you prefer. Now we're using Vallejo, but you can use Ishin Grey by Games Workshop 2 for this shin guard section. Now the one problem with these Vallejo paints is sometimes they do react with the washes and can actually become activated again and start moving around. Games Workshop paints have never done that to me, so that is the one advantage with Games Workshop paints. Now I could just add a little bit of varnish, but that's a whole extra stage that I don't really want to have to do. Instead, when it does come to the shading process, we'll just be very gentle, and as soon as we start seeing any of this grey paint unlocking, we stop, and we wait for it to dry, and we'll continue again. So when it comes to generic colours like blacks, whites and greys, I'm not particularly concerned about where the paint comes from, but when it comes to things like the skin, especially of an alien creature that is exclusive to the IP of Games Workshop, I want to be as accurate as possible. So that's why we're using the Fang by Games Workshop for the skin sections. In the official artwork for these Tau models, it looks like they've used Steel Legion Drab as sort of a denting slash weathering technique across all the accent panel lines and on the rough hard edges of the models. But I've decided to take a different step here, which is with a two-stage process where I use Agrax Earthshade as a sort of broad shade and then I go in on the much finer level with Rhinox Hide to really accent the deeper recesses of the model. Now this two layer process is of course very time consuming but I just prefer the results of it. I paint Epic 40k most of the time and the one thing that you really want to make sure that you have with Epic 40k due to the scale is high contrast and I've applied that same mentality here with these Tau models. This aggressive panel line accenting might seem a little bit unnatural but when they're on the tabletop I think it really helps make the models pop. This technique hasn't been used everywhere because it's not necessary everywhere, but I think for deep sections like the wrist guards, it's appropriate. The washers like to sit in crevices, and what's difficult to say about the side of this gun is there's not really any crevices. Yes, there's panel lines that need accenting, but the Agrax Earthshade won't really do that job. If you wanted to try and achieve strong high contrast results with, say, a flat area like the gun, I highly recommend varnishing with a gloss varnish and then using a brown oil paint to go into the recesses instead but you need to make sure that varnish is thin enough that you don't lose the definition of the very thing that you're trying to accent in the first place. Once we finish cleanup, we are going to move on to our base coat of all the lenses. We have a series of teals and turquoise here, and it's going to be a very simple process. It's just basically dots getting smaller. The base coat obviously is the widest dot, then we go in with a mid-tone, then we go in with a highlight, then we go in with what I call a flash, which is basically a tiny white dot but that's later on in the video. For now, let's just finish off our base coats of the blue here. Once we're happy, we're going to move on to the gold. 
And a quick beginner's guide pro tip, always make sure that you rinse your paint pot after you've been using metallic paints. You do not want those metallic flakes ending up in other paints where they're not wanted. And now we've got all of our base coat colours out of the way, we're going to move on to our first highlight, which in this case is the red. I'm going to be pulling the paint up this red chest panel very delicately. It's a 50-50 mix of paint and water, and it's nothing too crazy, it's very subtle. And then we finish it off with this third highlight, which is a orange. Now it's just on one side, and all of the sides in terms of highlights between the lenses and areas like this all match. So they're all coming from the top right direction. Now, as previously mentioned, we're going to be getting on with these lens highlights. This is the first one, and it is just a smaller dot within a larger dot. And on the actual eye lenses, we're going to be just focusing on the top right corner, pulling all the paint up towards a singular point. Now we're going to be moving on to our final highlight, and we're just going to be adding this to the top right edge of all the lenses, just very slowly working the paint in. Don't rush it, take your time, because honestly, fixing the mistake will take you longer than just doing the paint job in the first place. And finally, a single dot of white paint on all the lenses, which will act as the most reflective part of the lens. And to do the flash in very small areas, just make sure that you use the finest part of the brush and make sure the paint is flowing off as easily as possible without being too watery. Now I do make a mistake here, but these mistakes can be easily remedied by just adding the dark tone back over again, like so. Now it might seem counterintuitive, but actually silver is a great color to highlight gold, especially if you use it in small amounts. We're now going to be shading the skin. Now normally you'd actually add this layer after the first layer coat, which is a lighter blue, but I actually quite like adding it here and then any area where the wash hasn't receded into, I will then add the layer coat in that place instead. It's kind of working a little bit backwards to what the GW would recommend, but it's just a habit I've got into that seems to work fine for me. Now we're going to be focusing on highlighting the black areas. We're going to start with a dark gray first and then we'll work our way up to a lighter gray. Take your time, don't rush, otherwise you're going to give yourself more time wasted on repairs when they're not needed. As you can see I'm using a 45 degree angle on the brush with some of these hard edges. It's perfect for a battle ready model, obviously if you're trying to do anything more complex there's more strategies and techniques that you can use when creating a model with shifting colours and variations, but for this there's so many good hard edges to work from, just adding a little bit of light grey to these blacks is kind of all that's necessary. Now because we're working in black, these errors like this are pretty easy to fix because I haven't really got too much to work with. It's just a grey splodge that I can easily deal with, especially with these wonderful carved hard edges in the sculpt itself. Now once you've got everything as tidy as possible, we need to try and make these grey lines look a little bit more natural. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually make the black paint into a bit of a wash. We're going to start scraping the paint across the dark recesses try and make those grey lines seem to fade back into the fabric. This is kind of like a very, very rushed version of glazing. It doesn't need to be too detailed or too accurate because it obviously it is just the pants. It's not like a highly ornate piece of detailed fabric and as you can see once it's dried and after doing a few glazes it seems to blend in a little bit more naturally. Now with edge highlighting, it's generally a case of go lighter than what the colour is that you're painting onto. So make sure that your brush is on a 45 degree angle, it doesn't have too much paint on it, and you want to make sure the paint is not too watery either, because if it is, the paint will actually separate on the edges and go on either side of the area you're actually trying to paint, and that can be very frustrating. Now we're doing some edge highlighting on the belts here, very easy. If you don't want to do it that way, you can actually just paint the whole thing the light colour and just do one thick darker line through the middle. Now we're on to our first main blue, which is basically going over the base coat and the wash. This is not actually supposed to be the way around that you do it, but I quite like doing it this way. I've already found out where my darkest recesses are by already adding the wash on, and it gives me less places that I need to put this layer paint, which is 
doing the job just fine for me. Then we get straight on with highlighting with Fenrisian Grey here, and we're just going to be picking out the very top of these toe sections and just dragging the paint to the center from the left and the right side of each of the toes. Now with the highlighting, I would do as many layers as you feel necessary until you get the contrast and pop that you're looking for. This was a couple of layers, and as you can see, it's got quite contrasty on the top of the toes now. Now we're going to be doing the battle damage. It's just Rhinox hide on any hard edges where it would look like a lot of damage would occur. And if you want to try and make the damage a little bit more subtle, you can kick back in with some white to sort of break up the Rhinox hide a little bit so it looks a little less painterly and a little bit more detailed like so. We now finally get to see the advantage of pinning over just gluing the model directly to the base and it's having the model itself standing on top of the stones rather than submerged unrealistically in super glue and stones. Once we've got the height that we're happy with we're going to get rid of the excess pin otherwise the base won't sit properly, add the glue that's needed and then apply it to the base. Add some additional super glue underneath to attach the pin to the underside of the base and wait for the model to dry. We're now going to be getting rid of the airbrush pinning that we've been doing and as you can see just a simple twist and just pull it away and that pin will come right out no problem. We're just now going to need to scalpel or file away the excess airbrush paint that's not required to allow the plastic cement to do its job correctly. Now if you've already fully assembled the model this step won't even be needed anyway and obviously I've painted a lot of things that are going to be hidden by the gun that's going to be going over the front of the torso but I like to get things as thorough as possible. Once the excess paint and superglue has been removed from the model we can then begin assembly once the plastic cement has fully gone tacky. Now you would normally think that this would be a perfect time to wear gloves because obviously you're working with glue and you don't want to get glue on the model but I found that actually you make some pretty big errors when you wear gloves at this stage because you might not necessarily feel the glue on your fingers and then start touching the model all over the place and then all the paint's peeling off because you didn't feel the paint due to the gloves. That's why I do this stage without the gloves. Presentation is key and the rim of this base is actually very important. A lot of the time people overlook this part and it can really bring down the overall quality of a model. I highly recommend sanding the base down a little bit with some high grit sandpaper just to make it a little bit more porous and then add the paint on very thin. Try and avoid hitting any of the basing material because you don't want to have to go in and clean that up afterwards, it'd be quite difficult. And as you can see, I'm using quite a fat brush. That's for two reasons. One, it's quick and two, it minimizes this is the chance of seeing brush strokes. If you use a small brush, you're going to be doing this forever and you're going to be more likely than not ending up with brush strokes that you don't want to see. And a week later off camera and with the power of editing, here is the final kill team. So there we have it, the Tau Kill Team start to finish painting process. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did in recording it. But we must move onwards and quite literally upwards. We have to get on with Aeronautica Imperialis and all the bits and bobs that I've collected for that. 
the first edition and the second edition. But if you're new here, maybe consider subscribing, and if you enjoyed this episode, maybe consider giving it a thumbs up. But as always, I've been Vincent, signing off from here at Bunker 6.